Deep neural networks are incredibly powerful, but unfortunately can be very hard to train. In part, that's because with more and more parameters, we need more and more data, so each epoch of training takes longer. But independent of the data set, the depth of the network can be an obstacle to training. When we have success training shallow neural networks, we tend to see a large decrease in the loss in the first few epochs of training. But if we build a deep neural network out of dense or convolutional layers, the loss graph often looks more like this. Where we can run an awful lot of training with very little decrease in the loss. And remember, each epoch of training takes longer when we have an enormous data set. And so this can be a big obstacle to practical training of deep networks. To figure out why training gets so much slower as networks get deeper, let's think about what happens when we pass data through a very deep neural network. When we initialize a neural network, all of the layers have randomly chosen weights. And so when we pass an input through each layer of the network, the activations are being multiplied by a random weight matrix. And if we do this many, many times, then by the time the data gets to the output layer, almost none of what we're producing is actual signal related to the input. We've essentially scrambled that input into random noise. Then when we perform an update, we'll compute the loss on that output and propagate it back through the network. But that loss may not be very informative at the layers late in the network because their inputs were mostly random noise. And when we pass gradients back through the network, each layer multiplies the deltas by its weight matrix. And so by the time we get back to the early layers that had inputs with some meaningful connection to the data, the gradients have also been scrambled by many multiplications of random weight matrices. And so the updates that we do to the later layers aren't very meaningful because their inputs have been scrambled and don't mean very much. And the updates we do to the early layers aren't very meaningful because their gradients have been scrambled and don't mean very much. And so this is why we tend to see not much improvement for an awful lot of training time as gradient descent essentially wanders around randomly. So what can we do about this? Well, we'd like to create some way for the data to arrive at the later layers of the network and make their inputs more meaningful and also for loss gradients to arrive at the early layers of the network and make their updates more meaningful. And we can achieve both of those goals using skip connections. The idea of skip connections is to group up layers of the network into blocks, and for each block, have data go both through and around. Within each block, the layers will pass their data forward normally, but between blocks will have a new type of connection. And that connection works by combining the input to the block with the output from the block, giving two different paths for data to follow, one that goes through the block and one that goes around. We then need some way of combining the output of the block with the input to the block. And we want this to be a simple function that passes gradients along undisturbed. And for that, we have a couple of choices. We can either take the tensor of inputs and the tensor of outputs and add them element-wise, or we can concatenate those tensors.
The result is now a network that is built out of residual blocks. And we hope that these skip connections will accelerate training and make our loss graph look more like this. So why is it reasonable to expect that networks built out of residual blocks will be easier to train? Well, they have a couple of big advantages. The first big advantage of a residual block is that the function it is computing is augmenting the existing data. Since the input is being passed along and will still be available to later layers in the network, the job of this layer is no longer to figure out everything important about the input that needs to be passed along, but rather to figure out what information it can add on top of the input to make subsequent processing easier. And this sort of function tends to be much easier to learn because the block doesn't have to start by figuring out what information the input contains. Instead, the block starts by passing along all of the input and barely modifying it. If we're using concatenation, then the input is passed along unchanged in addition to whatever the block outputs. But even if we're using addition, when we initialize these layers with random weights, those weights tend to be small and centered around zero, meaning that what we add is initially close to zero, and so initially we will be passing along the information relatively unchanged. And so each block has a simpler task to learn, and each block has access to better information to learn from. The second big advantage is that we now have much shorter paths for the gradients to follow to get to each layer of the network. Since each block has one path that goes through its layers and one path that goes around them, the gradients will flow along both of those paths. And this means that any layer in the network now has a relatively short path by which loss gradients can arrive and usefully update what that layer is computing. And therefore, in the initial epochs of training, when the information coming along the path that goes through all of the layers is relatively uninformative, we can still get useful updates out of these shorter paths and get decreasing loss right away. Plus, over time, as the later blocks in the network start computing more and more useful functions, the information coming along this path will get more and more informative, and so our gradients can continue to decrease and outperform a shallow network. So these first two advantages of simplifying the function we need to learn and speeding up the propagation of gradient information are the main motivations behind building residual networks. But residual blocks turn out to have an additional advantage of modularity. Since each of these blocks have essentially the same structure, and since we are able to short circuit around those blocks in the initial training, it's relatively easy to add more blocks and build a deeper, more powerful network. And so when you read about residual networks in a paper or see an implementation in a model zoo, you'll often find several different variations on the same network with different numbers of blocks to achieve different trade-offs between the resources needed to train the network and the power of the resulting model. Because of all of this, residual network architectures are extremely powerful, and many of the same ideas have also been incorporated into the other network architectures we will study soon. But there are a few concerns we need to keep in mind when thinking about how to set up a residual network.
If we want to combine the inputs and outputs of a residual block by addition or concatenation, then we need to think about how do the shapes of those layers match up. If we just have activation vectors, like with dense layers, then we might have different numbers of neurons in the different layers. And some mismatch is inevitable, unless we are willing to have the shape of every layer in our network be dictated by the shape of the input representation. So if we are adding our inputs to the output of the first block, we either need some operation that will reshape the inputs, or we need to only add the inputs to a part of that block's output. This gets even more complicated if our blocks contain convolutional layers, where we definitely don't want to constrain the depth of all our later layers based on the color channels in the input. And we also need to make sure that the height and width of our convolutional layers can be combined with the height and width of the input. And so, when we're using residual blocks, we will usually want to have some special case for how we are getting the shape of the input to match up with the shape for the first block. And then we want to make sure that subsequent blocks have a common shape so that this sort of problem is minimized. Another concern is that if we use concatenation repeatedly to combine the outputs of many blocks, then we get a very, very large activation tensor and an explosion in the number of parameters. So even if the shapes match up well enough that we can do concatenation, the more times that we concatenate, the bigger this activation tensor gets. And since subsequent layers will have weights coming from each of these activations, we can end up with an explosion in the number of parameters if we overuse concatenation. And so if we are using lots of residual blocks, we should prefer addition over concatenation. And so you'll rarely see more than one or two skip connections that use concatenation in a single network. And so when we're building a large residual network, we'll generally use addition for most of the skip connections. And we'll try and have most of the blocks use a consistent shape so that we can match up the inputs and the outputs. But it's worth spending a little extra time to think about how can we achieve this goal when we're using convolutional layers. The first thing we can do to simplify convolutional blocks is use one-by-one -one strides and appropriate padding to ensure that the height and width of the image is preserved. And that way we know that when we add the input and output tensors for a block, at least the height and width dimensions will match up. But if we also want the channels dimension to match up, we can achieve that using one-by-one -one convolutions. Well, one-by-one -one convolutions might seem kind of silly, since they get their inputs from only one pixel of the image. But let's draw an illustration of what such a neuron would compute. If we perform convolution with a one-by-one -one kernel, 
Then we'll get an output block with the same height and width as the input block. And each of the neurons in the output will get its inputs from just one pixel of the input, but it will get inputs from the entire depth of that pixel's channel. Whether that's the three color channels of an input image, or the several different neurons that computed simple functions on the same window from the previous layer, but by setting the number of filters or channels for our one-by-one -one convolution, we can specify the depth of our output layer, and each of these neurons will get its input from every neuron across the depth of the previous layer, and so we can use this to either increase or decrease the depth. And so if we think by analogy to dense layers, adding this one-by-one -one convolution step is as though we inserted a single dense layer along this path to make the input and output shapes match up. There are lots of other variations on residual networks and how to build residual blocks, many of which include other types of layers that might do normalization or might pass data through multiple paths within a block. And so I encourage you to read about different types of residual architectures but all of them follow this common theme that achieves much better performance in terms of our ability to train deep neural networks.